Hello and welcome to The Soul of Business with Blaine Bartlett. I am your host, Blaine Bartlett. And today's guest is, uh, it's a, it's a, a how, do, how do they say, a reprise, I guess. <laughs> Jennifer's been on the show before, and I was so taken by the interview and, the, and what we were talking about that I had to have her come back. And you know, we've been able to coordinate calendars and, and make this happen. Uh, my guest is Jennifer Nash. She's um, you know, Dr. Jennifer Nash, PhD. Uh, she's an executive advisor, uh, Marshall Goldsmith 100 member. She's an author, leadership development consultant. She partners with Fortune 50 executives, yeah, literally around the globe. Um, she's presented her leadership and coaching research at Harvard, Columbia. She serves as an executive and leadership career coach at the University of Michigan, is a fellow at the Harvard McLean Institute for Coaching, and she is absolutely you know, just drop dead brilliant when you start thinking about the work that she does and the impact that she's having. So, Jennifer, welcome back. Oh, thank you so much, Blaine. I'm so excited to be here, and I'm just really looking forward to our conversation today. Great, great. Well, now, I, I, I want to just touch on your book. We're going to come back to that here because you've got a, a kind of a quote-unquote relaunch coming up as the audio book comes out. But um, Be Human, Lead Human, How to Connect People and Performance. And it's that, yeah, that connect people and performance piece. I love the tagline on this. Um, we talked a little bit about yeah. it in our last session together. Um, but you and I were talking just before we started the program here about you know the challenging job market and um, you know, mm -hmm. the insistence of some CEOs uh, more than perhaps I'd like, but you know that people you know start coming back into work into the office. Uh, and, I mean, there's a lot of dynamics in play, um, and yeah. they impact people directly. And as a consequence of that, they're impacting performance. Where are we going with this? What are you seeing in the tea leaves around this right now? Ah, oh, you know, Blaine, if, if I could answer that question perfectly, like I'd be, you know, a trillionaire, right? I think that's the question on everybody's mind right now. And what I see happening is, you know, we have we have this Pandora's box that's been opened. And I don't think there's any way to shut it again. And I think that, you know, the restriction of having people work five days in the office or versus, you know, people working five days from home. I think those are the extremes. I think most companies are going to land somewhere in the middle. You know, they'll realize that, you know, they need to allow their employees to work where it works best for them and when it works best for them. And as long as they're delivering the work and doing, doing what they need to do, those things should become less of an issue and the focus should be more on that quality of work that's produced, you know, the, 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 the timeliness of the deliverable um, and the, you know, meeting the expectations of the leader or the manager who asked for that, that requirement mm -hmm. or meeting the client's requirements. Yeah. So I think we're going to land somewhere in the middle. Yeah. I mean, you opened up a couple of points there that I want to just kind of you know, go down a rabbit hole with you on um, the idea mm -hmm. of autonomy. Uh, is is partly some of the pushback that uh, you know, is is present when people are you know, invited, quote unquote, to come back into the physical workspace. Um, right. And it's, I mean, there, there's a the whole five day work week notion, the work week notion, is such an artifact of the industrial revolution. Yes. And before that, people just did what they did in the time frame in which they needed to do it in order to produce the result that they said that they wanted to produce. So there, exactly. yeah, there was a lot of autonomy around, you know, how do I get this done? And here's the time frames. I understand the commitments that are necessary to fulfill on and that sort of stuff. We, we mm -hmm. kind of took that away from people when we started putting them in this artificial environment that was, you know, nine to five or eight to five or whatever uh, metric you had in there. Um, where this you know, is interesting for me is um, when we start looking at the nature of emotional engagement, you know, workplace engagement, I mean, Gallup has done their you know, engagement survey for 20 some odd years now, and it consistently shows that roughly 87% of the workforce globally is disengaged in some way, shape or form from the work. And that has not moved in 27 years, 25 years, something like that. And I've checked it for about 25 years. 
we're missing the mark on something here. And I'd be very interested, you know, given the work that you're doing in leadership. You know, again, we were talking about this a little bit before we started the uh, the show. Uh, I think we spend on average in the neighborhood of $42 billion a year globally on leadership development um, with the intention, yeah, <laughs> the subjective intention of moving that emotional engagement needle. And right. 42, yeah, $42 billion seems to be going down a rabbit hole because we don't seem to be getting any needle movement. Mm -hmm. Are we hitting the right demographic with our leadership development efforts? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's a great question. And I think there's so many factors that go into this dynamic, right? We've got we've got the traditional status quo saying, oh, people need to be in the office eight to five, nine to five, whatever it is, right? We've got the holdover from Taylor a hundred years ago saying, Here are here's the best way to do a job, here's the optimal way to do a job. And the unintended consequence of that was that we took away worker voice and autonomy. Yeah. And over 100 years later, we're still struggling with that. And we haven't gotten it back. And I think leaders today are looking, you know, the top level leaders are looking at what carrots and what sticks can I push or pull to incent the workforce to perform where I want them to perform. And I think we're looking at maybe the wrong carrots and sticks. You know, what if it were intrinsic motivational drivers mm -hmm. that we're looking and identifying what people really care about and are passionate about and love. And then that is the fuel that stokes the performance that's sustainable. And when we look at, you know, the role of a leader, you know, the role of a leader has really evolved, right? It's evolving into a facilitator and a coach who guides their teams and inspires their teams. And a manager's role, you know, if we think about this from Zelesnik's perspective, right? Um, a manager's role is really to control the chaos and execute and get things done in a in a guided fashion. Mm -hmm. So there's an opportunity there, I think, for managers to take a little bit of the leader playbook on inspiration and coaching and facilitation yeah. and integrate that into how they're doing their work. And we may see that there is a movement with that needle if that starts to happen. I, I could not agree with you more on that. I mean, I was uh, talking to John Cotter a number of years ago, and uh, yeah, just yeah, where do, where's the overlap between leadership and management? And just you know, when do I take one hat off and put the other hat on? And in a conversation, he said that is such a yeah amorphous line. It's such a fluid yeah piece, particularly in larger organizations. And I don't mean behemoths. I mean yeah, you know, an organization that's got over a hundred people in it. You're going to have a, a management group that needs to understand what it means to be a leader. And yes. when you're talking about carrot and stick, I'm struck by you know, just that whole meme is steeped in command and control. 100%. And, yeah, which is a traditional leadership model. And you were saying there's an evolution that is occurring today. Uh, that leaders, if they're not paying attention to, are going to be missing the mark on uh, what's possible. And rather than command and control, it really comes down to how do I influence movement rather than command movement. Yes, exactly. And, exactly. And, you know, so many of our playbooks, right, our rule books, our guidebooks for how we learn how to lead are based on what we observe people doing ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And so, there, I think there's an opportunity for leaders to take a step back, our current leaders today to take a step back, reflect on what is their role as a leader? How are they defining that? What does that mean to them? And if they shift that definition of a leader, then how is their identity needing to shift as well? And there's an uncomfortableness to that conversation that starts to occur because people, for the most part, don't like change. We love status quo. And we constantly you noticed that, huh? Oh, yes. So that, I think there's an opportunity there. And yeah. for leaders who are forward thinking, leaders who are ahead of the curve, leaders who are great at inspiring and influencing their team, you know, they're the ones that are winning the talent war right now. Yeah. It may be a tough job market, but for the leaders who are able to influence and inspire their team in a way that brings, helps them show up at their best, they are going to be the ones where the talent is flocking to.
because they understand that it doesn't matter where or when or how you work. It matters what the work product is and how motivated and engaged you are to produce that and, you know, be be operating at your potential as a human being as well as an employee. You know, there's a couple of things. I, I love this conversation. I, I love how you position things because it just gets me percolating here. <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the traditional manage, and I'm going to put this in the context of mindset. The traditional management mindset is organized around doing. Yeah, you know, what do I need to yeah. do in order to get the result? Uh, so it's all around execution. That's and predictability is kind of the litmus. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. work the, you know, develop the plan, work the plan. So yep. what we're talking about here is not so much what do I need to do. It's more about who do I need to be in order to have this outcome that we're aspiring to, uh, which is, I'm going to put it back in the context of here again of of emotional engagement. Who do I need to be in order to engage my people effectively? Mm -hmm. Who do I need to be? Not what do I need to do, which takes the carrot and the stick out of the, out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you spoke to intrinsic motivation. Um, You're being able to call that out, identify it and call it out and invite people to actually, you know, what's in this for me? Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that conversation. What do you get to be, do, or have if we're successful on this endeavor? Ask that question. Now that yeah. you know, requires that I have to be vulnerable. If I'm going to be sitting across from an employee and saying, "I don't know what you want. Tell me what." Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting conversation to have. Mm-hmm. Who do I need to be in order to have you engage with me fully? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, what, you can take it one step further as well for the leader. You know, who do I want to be? Not what everyone else around me is telling me I should be or what my precursors have said I should be yeah. or how I ought to behave. But who do I want to be in this role as a leader? How am I sh- going to show up? What values am I bringing to the table, you know, that guide my decision making as a human being, but also as a leader, right? We're one person. We're not divided in half when we walk in the door at work. So yeah. how can we figure out what that looks like for the leader themselves and taking that time to reflect and deep dive into forming that description and identity of who we want to be and then determining, well, what do my people need from me and what do they need to see so that you can shape that conversation around what they can expect from you mm-hmm. and decide what those behaviors look like. And, you know, a lot of times in the work that I'm doing with my clients, this barely becomes an opportunity to dig some deeper into those mental models and that thinking around what is shaping the behaviors that I have today as it is. Where are those actually coming from? And are they working for me today or not? And if you look at your engagement rates on your team, you might be able to figure out if they're looking well, you know, working well for you or not. Yeah. Yeah. And, And that, you know, the language there of working. Yeah, is this working or not working? Which is fundamentally different from is this the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? Is this good or bad? You know, yeah. Both, you know, both of those vernaculars you know require a judgment. Working or not working is just a clean assessment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. And it's data focused, right? So we're mm-hmm. taking the evaluation and assessment out of it. There's no good or bad here. There's just what is working, what's not working. And yeah. You know, oftentimes I will also ask leaders, what's one thing you could change about yourself, about this role, about the organization, about this team? What's one thing that you could change? And then what are the behaviors and thinking on your part that can help affect that change? Yeah. You know, we're going to take a real quick break here. Uh, but, you know, one of, you know the, this notion of change, you know, we talked about this right a little bit ago here. People don't like change. Uh, even <laughs> if they can recognize that it will probably be positive, you're still going to get resistance. And that has always been a very interesting you know, paradox. And I want to unbundle that a little bit from your perspective uh, when we come back from this break. Okay? Okay. Sounds good. Great. The nature of life is evidenced in nature. Nature grows, and all of nature honors the desire to be more, to have more, and to do more. Life thrives when it's allowed to grow. And ideally, thriving is what we also, all of us, want to be able to do. Unfortunately, at some stage in life, most people find themselves settling into what I can only call a rut. 
and a rut is nothing more than a coffin with the ends kicked out. You want to quickly get out of any rut that you find yourself in. When you stop growing, that's when the coffin starts to appear. You know, the simple truth is this, and this is true for everything in nature. You're going to die. I'm going to die. Every one of us dies. So the question we need to come to grips with is not are we going to die. The question nature asks us to answer is are we truly living? That's what motivation is about. It's the desire to move. It's the desire to grow and to excel. Have I lived? How have I lived? I'd love for you to take advantage of my Leadership Mindset Masterclass. It's all about providing you with the tools to ensure thriving for yourself and for those around you. Register today to receive the free introduction video and find out more about this acclaimed program. You'll also receive a copy of my international number one bestseller, Compassionate Capitalism, A Journey to the Soul of Business. I'm Blaine Bartlett, and I look forward to helping you thrive. Welcome back, folks. Um, before we took the break, I was asking Jennifer uh, to uh, kind of think a little bit about and, and have a conversation with me about the you know the this phenomena of change, and more more specifically, the resistance that almost everybody universally has to any kind of change. Um, and I'm going to just you know position something and then we can kind of unbundle it. Um, I, you know, from my perspective and the observation that I've had with the clients that I work with, the difficulty with change is never really the change itself. It's the disruption to the existing relationships that the change causes. Yes. And it, it really becomes an issue of relationship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kind of the question, who am I, where do I belong in the face of this change and what I'm as comfortable with over here no longer is existing. And yes. that all of a sudden yeah, gets real squirrely. And most leaders don't know how to deal with relationships well, in my experience. Fair, yes. fair so, assessment? Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm laughing a little bit because, you know, the research that I did for the book, it showed that, you know, most leaders, they don't have any relationship plan in place. They yeah. spend most of their time on things that are not relationship related. And if you look at the role of a leader to what it's evolving to, you know, a leader is spending most of their time on, they should be spending most of their time on building, sustaining, and nurturing relationships. Yeah. That is a leader's job at this point. And so it's so interesting that you bring that up, that, you know, relationships are really this key. And when you think about the relationship of someone um, when their job changes, right, their function changes, or their yeah. tasks change, or their relationship to this particular um, business unit changes, you know, what's driving, you know, some of that resistance to those changes? Well, we talked earlier about how, you know, people resist change. We're just, we're, it's ingrained in our brain. We like security of the status quo. And one of the things that disrupts that is when we are afraid of what's happening with this change because we don't understand how it's going to impact us. And so, you know, if you look at trying to remove that resistance to change, the first thing you need to understand is what are people afraid of? Yeah. What is it that they're scared of? What is it that they're uncertain about? You know, the second thing is, you know, um, the ego, right? There's, there's an ego part in change. So if we're changing from something to something unknown, something that we know to something unknown, how, what does that mean for me as my identity? Who mm-hmm. am I in that new scenario, in that new future state? And how does that impact me? How does it impact perceptions of those around me? What are people going to think if all of a sudden I'm, you know, doing this role instead of that role, for example? And so there's all these different levers that go into that resistance to change. Um, and, you know, in, in my work doing a lot of, you know, change management for organizations and communications, something that helps alleviate that resistance to change is communication and relationships Mm -hmm. and taking the time to explain to people, Hey, this is what's happening. This is why we are doing this change. This is why it's so important. You know, when I was at Ford Motor Company, you know, I remember one of the leaders coming on to a town hall and saying, look, you know, we have to change or we're going to die. And, you know, that was sort of like the 
wake up call for a lot of people to say, oh my gosh, like this amazing company that's been around for, you know, a hundred years yeah. might possibly go under. Oh my gosh, like we need to understand, like, so, you know, Cotter, right? There needs to be that impetus and that catalyst to start going down that path of change for most people. Otherwise, it won't happen. Yeah. And so yeah, creating but, those conditions. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, there were you know, Larry Bossidy's burning platform analogy. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The you know, yeah. We got to do this or we're going <laughs> to, we're going to die. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. The idea of, um, Let's see here. Uh, connecting people to performance. I, I really do want to kind of come back to that because, you know, the, and, and folks, again, the, the the front end title. This is the tagline: connecting people to, uh, to performance. Be human and lead human. I know you chose that title for a real specific reason. Uh, can you talk a little bit about kind of what led to your landing on that main title? Be human and lead human. What's going on there? Sure. You know, so often we look at leaders as they've got to have all the answers, right? They The buck stops there. They have to know everything. Um, you know, they're the ones that have to save the day. Um, and sort of this idea of like the leaders have to be these superheroes. Yeah. And oftentimes I think leaders also feel like there is a certain set of behavioral rules that they need to abide by and they need to look and dress and think and act and speak and be in a certain way. Um, and so this title of this book is an invitation to leaders to strip all of that away and get back in touch with who they are as human beings, you know, is mm -hmm. who they are as people because we're people first. And then yeah. when they allow that to come forward into their work and show up as their authentic self, then they are leading human as well, right? They're leading themselves. They're leading others more humanely. And they're leading an organization to produce, you know, good for the whole of humankind. So yeah. that was sort of the impetus around this title and, and an invitation to leaders to say, look, it's tiring. Like, I know that superhuman cape looks great. But maybe it's time to just take that off. It can be a really heavy weight and be yeah. who you are, lead with vulnerability, lead with courage, lead with empathy, lead with compassion and show up as a human being and show up in that way first, as opposed to the title or the role that you're holding in the organization so that you can lead human and, you know, maybe be a hero at the same time sometimes, yeah. but, you know, mostly be, be human. Be human. You know, th this whole notion of authenticity. Um... Yeah, I, I wrestled with how I would define that because I do a program with the American Association for Physician Leaders. And, yeah. and the title of the program is Leadership Authenticity. And I kept having folks say, well, what do you mean by authentic, you know, authenticity? And you know, I, uh, so I pulled Kierkegaard down. I, I mean, I, I pulled all kinds of stuff. <laughs> for, you know, what's a, what's a real intelligent uh, definition of authenticity? Essentially where I landed was it, it's what I'm left with when I stop trying to manage your perception of me. I, mean, oh, I love that. And that requires an incredible amount of vulnerability. And, and where this, I think, gets really powerful, and I want to just check my thinking with, uh, on, you know, with you on this. To be vulnerable, and, and actually to, you know, I mean, literally, to be vulnerable, to be open in that way, I have to experience a certain amount, or at least assume a certain amount of safety exists in the environment. Yes. Would that be a, okay? Now, where, where this gets to be, I think, interesting, if I, as the leader, am assuming that safety is is requisite here in order for vulnerability to occur, and I can demonstrate vulnerability and signal that it's safe, all of a sudden, people around me start to feel safe, even in the midst of chaos and change. Is 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 that kind of a, an interesting, a useful way of, of coding things here, if you will? I think it's a really interesting perspective on it. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? The emotions that we emit, they're, they're, they're you know, the yeah. emotion contagion happens in milliseconds, yeah. right? So if we feel safe to be vulnerable, 
you know, there is something that we're emitting on some wavelength or some frequency that people are picking up on around us. Mm -hmm. And it has that ripple effect. So we feel safe, we be vulnerable. And in turn, it has that like heliotropic effect where it's going to ripple out and the circle around us will feel that. And then the circle around them will feel that sort of like when you drop a pebble in a pond and the ripple goes out. Eventually, that will cascade throughout the entire organization. So I love what you said about, you know, when you drop away everything that, that you said it so beautifully, you know, how, when you let everything go of how you're, what you think people will perceive of you and you just show up, um, there is such power in that. And people recognize that. Yeah. And it takes an immense amount of strength to do that. In my experience, that is absolutely true. It, uh, yeah, the the whole notion of trust, um, you know, safety and trust kind of come into play here. But at the end of the day, I think in order for me to truly be vulnerable as a leader, I have to trust that I can handle the consequence of being vulnerable. Yeah. It's not yeah. about, you know, can I trust you? It's can I trust me to handle the consequence of opening up? Mm-hmm. And that goes back to this notion of, you know, what, who am I being rather than what am I doing? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That, this whole idea of the, the best leaders are the ones that know themselves best. You know, I mean, this is Marcus Aurelius. I mean, if I go <laughs> yeah. all the way back to those times. Uh, yes. Yeah. And or, even Socrates, right? Know Socrates, thyself. yeah. The Oracle of Delphi, know thyself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, in the book, I really talk about that, right? I, I I point people to that's the starting point, right? As leaders, we're so often told, well, we lead other people. But in reality, what I've learned, if I've learned anything over 25 years of working in industry and professional services, is that you have to lead yourself first. Yeah. And, you know, I think this is what our conversation today is really focusing on. I think it is. Mm-hmm. Jennifer, I'm afraid we're going to be coming to a close here, unfortunately. Um, I want to, yeah, I started off by mentioning the book. I want to come back to this. Uh, you're going to be doing a quote unquote relaunch. It's not really a relaunch, but you've got the audible version of this thing coming out. And yeah. folks, I've, I've read the hard, I've read the book, the physical book. It is a great book. You need to you know, actually get a copy of this and do something with it. But for those of you that yeah, don't want to have a, something in your hand or on your tablet to read, um, when do you, you know, when is the audible likely to be coming out? And yeah, yeah, just yeah, go ahead and riff on this for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you know, we had a little bit of a delay with the audiobook because um, the publisher that I was working with, there were some leadership changes in the organization, and so things were a little unsettled for a while. Um, so it took me a couple months to get that audiobook together and you know, punched and everything out and into the world. So I am expecting that it's out in the next couple of weeks. Um, and so, you know, listeners or watchers who prefer to listen to something um, are more than welcome to pick up a copy. It'll be at whatever location they prefer to get their audio books, you know, whether it's yeah. Apple or Amazon or Audible, you know, the places I think Scribd oh. is also one of them. Scribd, really? Oh, that's, that's a new one. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Where can people find out more about you and what you're up to? What, what uh, you know, LinkedIn obviously would be... Uh, uh, one that I'm assuming people could get some some information, but do you, you know websites and that sort of thing? What, where where can I send yeah. people? Yeah, so LinkedIn um, has my LinkedIn newsletter. They can follow me, subscribe to the newsletter. Um, they can find me at my website, which is drjennifernash.com. So it's dr jennifernash.com. Um, they can find the Human Leader Index online, which you access through my website, which is also part of the book, and that's complimentary. Um, and since we last talked, Blaine, um, there is now a Human Leader Facebook community um, oh. that people can join, and that's also complimentary. So they can head over there and, and search for that under the groups on Facebook. All right. Well, that's, I'm, I'll go check that one out myself. <laughs> okay. Folks, Dr. Jennifer Nash uh, has been uh, a reprise guest. Uh, and Jennifer, thank you so much. Uh, I love our conversations. They go by way too fast. It's you know, it's frustrating in that regard. I wish you didn't live on the other coast. I'd love to sit down and have a coffee with you. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. It's it's been such a pleasure, and thank you for having me back again. And you know, I just I hope all of your listeners find value in in what we're discussing today. I'm sure they will. I know I did. Um, there's no question about that. 
Folks, you've been listening, uh, like I said, to Dr. Jennifer Nash. This is Blaine Bartlett. You're listening to The Soul of Business with Blaine Bartlett. Uh, check out my website, you know, learn.blainebartlett.com or blainebartlett.com. Both of them will take you, you know, basically to the same place eventually. Um, we've got some stuff going on there. I've got a new mastermind program coming up as you're listening to this. We'll be you know, launching the... Uh, uh, the fourth year of the leadership mastermind, mindset mastermind, uh, and yeah, you know, we're getting rave reviews and rave results out of that. So feel free to poke around on the website and find out a little bit of information about that as well. And I'll see you on the next episode. Have a great rest of your week as you're listening to this, and find ways in your life to be a center of distribution. Um, that's kind of how life works best when you're giving things away, including yourself. Take care, and I'll talk to you next time. See you next time, more precisely. <laughs> Bye. Hi, I'd like to uh, ask you to do something for me, if you wouldn't mind. If you like this episode, I'd like you to uh, not only subscribe uh, on your favorite site, but I'd also like you to uh, give a rating. Uh, ideally, a, a five-star rating would be you know, greatly appreciated. But I think more importantly also would be just uh, some uh, comments. Uh, that helps with the algorithm and it helps build the, uh, the audience with this. And more than anything else, if you could um, invite somebody else to listen, just share this episode with a friend, with a colleague, and uh, I'd like to see how we can grow the soul of business. I think it makes a difference. Thanks.